Thank you. It's, it's, it's wonderful to have you all with us today for our latest instalment of, uh, of Conversations with Strategy, where we discuss some of the big issues in the world and, and find out more about the careers of some of our illustrious visiting fellows. And I'm really delighted to have with us today um, Professor John Tesh, who is um, an expert on a whole range of matters, but I think will be of particular interest to us today in talking about civil contingencies, planning for risk, for emergencies, for, for, for crises like terrorism and global pandemics. So there's, there's a lot uh, for us to, to get, our, get our teeth into today. But let me just give you a bit of a background on, uh, on John before we get started. Um, John spent most of his early career in the Ministry of Defence. He was involved in international security policy. He spent time working for the UK delegation to NATO on nuclear weapons and was also involved in, in the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq in 2003. He's worked in the think tank world at Chatham House um, and the Royal Institute for International Affairs. And from 2006 to 2012, he was involved as the head of the capabilities team for the National Risk Assessment and National Risk Register, um, supporting the Prime Minister and Cabinet from, um, from the National Security Secretariat and particularly dealing with these questions about civil emergency planning and response. So, John, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Fantastic. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to sort of kick off um, by just, just asking, as we do um, most of our, our guests, um, what was it that, um, that led you to, to take the decision to um, follow a career in, in, in public service and, and moving into the civil service in, in, in particular? Um, obviously, we, we often talk to, um, to our visiting fellows about their experience at university when they were sitting in a similar position to, uh, to, to, to those in our audience today. So I just was wondering, sort of, what, what was it that, that led you to, to take that decision? Uh, well, I think I'd, I'd say, first of all, I wouldn't recommend anyone copy my example. Um, I took my finals um, in um, classical greats at Oxford in 1976. And as usual, I'd left everything to the last moment. So I hadn't really thought about uh, what I wanted to do with a degree. Um, I wasn't confident I was going to get a good degree. And I hadn't a clue uh, what sort of career uh, I wanted. Um, so I dug around in the library um, one day, and then I remember that my father had been very keen uh, that I should join the Foreign Office, because um, that's what he did all his life, and indeed what my mother did when she started. Uh, and so I, one of the things I did was apply to the Foreign Office um, but because I wasn't expecting a good degree, I sort of applied through the mainstream. Uh, and then at the last moment, I got slightly cold feet because it seemed to me that my father was um, uh, having hesitations about uh, the ch career he'd chosen. So um, his strong recommendation that I go into public service um, was looking a little bit fragile. Mm -hmm. So at the last moment, I asked to, for my application form, form to be changed to say that I'd be willing to consider other government departments, not just the Foreign Office. And I was offered the MOD, so uh, arrived at the MOD, with no clear plan and by accident. Uh, and as I say, I probably wouldn't recommend that approach to other people. You, know, you need to give it some thought. Uh, and how did the did the departments that you worked in, particularly the Ministry of Defence, where you where you, where you start, how, how did that change during your time in government? Um, and particularly for those who are looking to apply to jobs in in those departments today, what what sort of advice could you give them um, about navigating entry into into the civil service? Oh, entry into the civil service. Um, well, I'd be. Uh, I wouldn't do what I did, which is going to this mainstream, because the first thing I had to do when I got to the MOD was reapply <clears throat> through the fast stream. And so that, you know, there was a waste of a couple of years. So have confidence in yourself. If you, if you think that public service and civil service is for you, then um, go for it. Um, if you want to know how the civil service has changed and what the sort of current priorities are, then I'd recommend you look at the 2012 Civil Service Reform Plan, which was done by Ollie Robbins before he became the sort of uh, the Brexit permanent secretary. 
and then left government altogether. And there's quite a lot in there about um, the sort of characteristics uh, of uh, life and work in the civil service and the ways in which it's changing. So during the time I was uh, in the MOD, which was 30 years from <clears throat> uh, 1976 to 2006, when I moved to the cabinet office, uh, we were already moving uh, in a sort of line towards more evidence-based policy making. I think when I arrived there, there was a lot of sort of uh, making it up as we went along. And uh, there were some very bright people. So um, on the whole, they tended to get it right. But um, with a more complicated uh, defense and security landscape uh, and ministers who were inclined to sort of question advice more than they did, then uh, we had to sort of start getting used to the idea that we had to prove that our policy recommendations were um, accurate and complete and taking take into account, uh, you know, the implementability of them. I, uh, were they practical policy options or were they simply something we invented in the bath? Uh, and the 2012 civil service reform plan took that one stage further by saying, not only should your policy recommendations be evidence-based and um, have a strong practical bent to them, they should also be, uh, if possible, open processes. I, you have to invite experts from outside the civil service. And that was because at the time, we had the um, Conservative government. I actually was a coalition, but the, the, the driving force on civil service reform was from the uh, Conservative uh, Party. They were um, viewing the civil service as um, full of very able people, but a closed shop uh, and um, dangerously so. So, um, the skill set you need for the civil service, I think, is, has been changing. So there's um, uh, at the beginning when I joined, there was a lot, lot of emphasis on intellectual skills and um, communication skills and strategic thinking skills. So you know the ability to take in the whole landscape uh, and apply intellectual horsepower that you know gained doing these high powered PPE degrees and, <clears throat> and so forth uh, to come up with elegant solutions. Uh, and when I left, um, that was still there, but it was much more about, you know, uh, are you clear about what the context is for the work you would be doing? Uh, have you got a sort of good um, organized mind around um, the analysis of the issue? Um, but also have you got good stakeholder management skills so that you can engage with and uh, use all the other people that have to be involved? Because, um, I mean, the, imp the impression I have got uh, is, and I'm sure people will say it was always complicated, but policy making is becoming um, ever more complicated because society is becoming ever more complicated. And um, yes, th thank, thanks for, 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 for those insights on that. And I, I was going to ask, actually, because you, you were obviously in, the, in, the, in a period where historians now talk about the 1990s as sort of a holiday from history, where sort of big geopolitical and strategic questions weren't quite as acute as maybe they were in the, in the Cold War, or um, as we've seen in recent years, you were dealing with sort of some major national security questions, whether it was nuclear proliferation, um, in, in your work with NATO, whether it was to do with, um, with, with questions about terrorism. And so what did you learn about sort of risk and, and managing it um, from that period of your career? Well, it's funny because, um, I mean, basically, as I recall, I spent about 10 years from 76 just learning the ropes. Mm. So I was sort of traveling around, went to the Navy, Army, Air Force, uh, did some central uh, jobs to do with um, military training uh, and equipment procurement and so forth to equip me with the sort of 
breadth of experience you need because no one ever comes to the MOD actually knowing much about defense. Mm. Uh, and then uh, I went through private office. I went into this, the newly formed strategy unit in the uh, Ministry of Defense, which was called uh, the uh, Policy Study Secretariat. Um, which was just um, gearing up for the big Gorbachev changes in the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, um, people in the academic world to advise us on what these changes in the Soviet Union would actually mean for defense. Uh, and also to start sort of exercising how we would go around analyzing and assessing uh, the strategic risks and opportunities that would come if um, Gorbachev's uh, promises came to light. I then spent a year doing uh, some management work in the Ministry of Defense, which is something MOD is always doing, it's always reorganizing itself. Uh, before they sent me to Brussels to be uh, the sort of nuclear planning rep uh, in, in NATO as part of the UK delegation. And almost well, within a year, we had the, uh, I think it was a Christmas day, 1991 uh, declaration that the Soviet Union didn't exist anymore. And uh, <coughs> Uh, that it was being replaced by uh, the Russian Federation. <clears throat> and uh, Gorbachev went and Yeltsin came in. And so I sort of didn't have a job anymore. I mean, there was still a year to go while we worked out how much of the nuclear posture we could safely drop on the basis uh, that it wasn't really strictly needed, but you know how much we'd keep just in case there was any sort of comeback. Um, and um, instead of doing nuclear planning, which is not something I had had much training for, but was learning about, uh, I started doing the outreach work to the new, newly um, independent, uh, if you like, uh, members of the Warsaw Pact and um, former uh, Soviet republics. Uh, and people were starting to talk about, you know, what would the nature of the relationship be between NATO countries and these Eastern European countries? Um, uh, and what would we say if they said, well, can we join? Which, of course, they did. Uh, and then what was the meaning of some of the sort of collapsing of states that seem to follow the ending of the, the Cold War. So Czechoslovakia fell apart, fortunately an amicable uh, divorce. But when we looked at Yugoslavia, uh, you, know, you could see the beginnings of what we hoped wouldn't be a pattern of um, internal collapse, failing states in Europe that would bring the prospect of war in Europe back again. And, you know, we just spent however many years it was um, from the origins of NATO um, trying to make as, hu uh, as certain as humanly possible that we would never have war again in Europe. So, um, you know, that's really when I started to get involved in strategy. I mean, up, up until then, I think work in the MOD was largely housekeeping. You know, we would just have to work out exactly how many troops we could afford for the, exactly how much money that was affordable within the budget uh, and the big strategic issues um, around nuclear deterrence and uh, the nature of the Alliance. <clears throat> uh, you know, all the hard thinking about them had been done, but all of a sudden, uh, we had to adapt to a very different situation. And, uh, you know, if I had to say what it is that made uh, my time in the MOD as enjoyable as it was after such an inauspicious start, it was that and the fact that 
as you say, there was a sort of 10 year uh, interregnum where plenty went wrong, but um, you know, the, the uh, chess pieces were all being uh, reorganized around us. Uh, and the process of working out how exactly we would respond to that was uh, what made it all worthwhile, really. And, and then uh, obviously you moved in this sort of early part of the 21st century into some of this work in, in, in civil contingency and planning in terms of risk. And I'm sure many people in the audience will be aware of the work of large risk consultancy firms like Stratfor or the Eurasia Group that deal with these big sort of political risk consultancy on um, dealing with businesses and, and advising them. What's the difference, would you say, between say someone who's looking at a career in the sort of corporal world of, of, of understanding risk and understanding risk within the sort of a government um, setting? Um, well, I've seen a little of the um, uh, sort of political risk uh, work done by um, firms like that and you know, control risks with whom I've worked for a while. Um, and it's a very different animal. Uh, they are talking about forecasts of what might or might not happen uh, over the next, you know, generally fairly short period because political uh, risk is, um, and it's got a very short shelf life risk assessment. Um, the, the reason why the British government started doing risk assessment was um, in a sense much simpler than that. It's just that when uh, Tony Blair was Prime Minister in 2000-2001, there were three um, what in retrospect seemed like rather minor emergencies but were um, embarrassing to the government there because of how badly they were handled and I think there was one which was a flood in Carlisle where the first thing that went under the water was the police station where they were supposed to be um, <clears throat> organizing the response and recovery effort. And of course, they therefore spent the first four or five hours of the emergency trying to look for a pl place to organize the response from. And that wasn't so bad, but we then had the foot and mouth disease outbreak where a small outbreak of foot and mouth disease uh, amongst cattle was allowed to get out of control and we ended up with um, I think 16 million head of cattle having to be slaughtered around the country and pictures of uh, army officers supervising the uh, digging of trenches and, and burning of carcasses um, which was uh, all because no one had really thought through uh, the process of responding to that kind of outbreak. And then we had the fuel strike where uh, tanker drivers went on strike, um, refused to deliver fuel from depots to garages. And within a week, fortnight, uh, the country was more or less at a standstill. Uh, and would have been if uh, I think a consultant at a hospital somewhere said, OK, fine. Now you've had your fun. Now the first person is going to die and I want to know who to blame. Mm -hmm. uh, so they did what they should have been doing in the first place, which was negotiated a, a way out of it. But it demonstrated that um, we really didn't have a handle on um, the perhaps slightly less catastrophic risks. And you know, we've been so focusing on avoiding Armageddon and World War III that we've forgotten that actually in the real world, um, lots of uh, things happen. Uh, and then Tony Blair asked um, his cabinet office strategy unit to just look into the reasons why. And they said, it's, it's very simple. It's the world is becoming more and more interconnected. The world is, the, the science and technology uh, uh, bring huge benefits, but they also bring uh, a downside. 
And uh, the complexity of the world that we're living in now means that even quite small, minor uh, emergencies can quickly cascade and spill into other areas. Uh, and moreover, if you're planning for them, you don't really know what the consequences are going to be, because in the old days, you know, they would be very straightforward. A happens, therefore B happens. <clears throat> Um, whereas now it's A, B, C that feeds back into A, and it's very complicated. Um, also, uh, they pointed out that governments were uh, in the post-war period acquiring more and more responsibilities for uh, the lives of citizens. Mm. Um, and uh, they weren't at the same time building the capacity and the capability to discharge those responsibilities uh, uh, and um, as a consequence, uh, people have lost trust in government and there was quite a big uh, lot of literature at that time uh, suggesting that um, in other parts of Europe, particularly in less so in Britain uh, and in the United States, so public trust in government was, was you know, going uh, that way. And uh, with all these types of emergencies, you have to engage with the public. They have to trust you. Otherwise, uh, as we're discovering with COVID, mm. yeah. uh, you know, if, if, if people won't do what you don't believe you uh, and won't do what you say they should do, then, you know, you've lost control. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so anyway, Tony Blair said, well, you know, we need to do something about this. So they set up the CCS uh, and uh, it basically, over the time that it had since 2001 through to when I left it, um, it had basically three uh, things it had to do. First of all, it had to get a tabs on the things that are most likely to happen. Uh, so we set up a sort of three monthly uh, forward look uh, looking six months ahead um, so that you could just write down uh, a list of what's happened, what the most likely to be most serious uh, and see what you've got in the cupboard uh, to be better prepared for it. And then when they'd done that for a couple of years, they said, yeah, but wouldn't it be a good idea if we could look a little bit further ahead and find out what is the worst that could happen uh and build some capability to do that because otherwise we're all forever improvising mm. uh and so they built up the program that i was in charge of um with a five-year national risk assessment and when we'd done that um uh we had the olympics coming on so we did another risk assessment for the olympic games to try and establish priorities for um resilience work around the olympics security and resilience work and then uh, when the 2010 coalition government came in, they said, well, actually what we'd like to do is look much further ahead. So could you have a look five to 20 years and see what are the areas where the trends indicate uh, that we're gonna have to change, not just equipment and preparedness, but also policy, our whole approach to things. And at about the same time, uh, there was a move to uh, do a climate change risk assessment mm -hmm. uh, and those are the things so the reason why government was doing it was to build the capability to deal with emergencies the reason why consultancy firms do risk is because their clients are interested in knowing um, where they need to hedge their bets uh, and, I, and as you say that, that sense of looking sort of long term into the future which is obviously a, a difficult thing when you're dealing with questions of uncertainty um, but I wanted to move on to, to COVID in, in, in a second, because obviously that is, that is the, the pressing issue at the moment. And I'm sure we'll have questions on that as well. The question I wanted to ask you about first, though, was about you were involved in the government's response to the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko. And obviously after the poisoning of the Scrip House in, in Salisbury, we, this, is be, this is very much um, something that we, that we dealt with again. Um, what, what sort of lessons did you, did you draw from that? that? I suppose that's not... that. Was that something that was already on your radar that this something that might happen um, in Britain, or is it something where it, it sort of came out of the blue and then you're having to deal with sort of a with a response sort of on the hoof? Um, well, it's a sort of 
yes, it, we were preparing for that kind of thing, but no, we didn't have a you know scenario for that a detailed mm -hmm. incident. So um, the uh, 2005 um, National Risk Assessment, which uh, is the first one we produced um, I, before my time, because I arrived in 2006, um, they were definitely interested in um, chemical biological uh, agents uh, and uh, the potential for malicious use of them as part of what you might call broadly terrorist activity. Uh, did we have that particular scenario? No, but um, we did have by then the machinery to pull together the people we needed in the same room to understand what's going on. And also the beginnings of a, well, not the beginnings, um, the development out of counter-terrorist work mm. uh, of a process for um, managing um, that kind of emergency and the, uh, the, the key here is that um, you, you never have a plan for the thing that actually happens. It's a sort of uh, <clears throat> a truth well known in the military that you, you, you tend to have a whole shelf full of plans. You pick the one that you think is gonna uh, do, and then it never survives first contact with mm -hmm. reality. Um, the problem with uh, the Libya Neoko thing was uh, that we had two kinds of emergency going on at the same time, uh, both caused by the same thing. The first was that their crime had taken place and the police had to be able to um, investigate the crime. And the second was that there was a health emergency because this stuff was going all over the place and uh, we needed public health experts um, to come in and tell us what the nature of the health emergency is and what needed to be done to make sure that the public was alerted to it. And, and um, so reconciling two different objectives, uh, that of investigating crime and protecting public health uh, poses its own challenge. But the machinery we just set up, which was basically a flexible sort of um, toolbox where you, you could go into COBRA, uh, uh, you know which minister's in charge with a terrorist emergency is always the Home Secretary. You know who you need to ring up to, to come in, the Health Protection Agency, as it used to be called, uh, and the, the police, and also um, you know, the other uh, experts and players. Uh, and there is a process you go through to say, okay, fine. Uh, do we understand what the situation is? Um, can we make sense of what's going on? I, do we actually know what's going on? And the second question then after that is, can we know what it means? Uh, because you can't uh, efficiently deal with an emergency until you've worked out um, what the consequences are uh, long-term and what you're gonna to have to deal with. Great, I, I, well, I want to open up to, to questions. So if anyone has questions, please, please put up your hand or, or comment in the chat. But I, I'm just gonna ask one last question while you're, while you're thinking of your questions. I so said, I've got a lot more and I'd be very happy to go into those. Um, but uh, just the last one before we open up was as we move on to the question of, um, of COVID, was um, so sort of looking, obviously you're looking from the outside. So it's not, um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot that's going on that, that we just don't know at the moment. But I was wondering if just, just from, your, from your perspective on it, and you were talking about that this, it doesn't survive first contact with the enemy. And we, we've seen a lot of newspaper reporting of, of Britain preparing for a flu pandemic and not necessarily thinking of something like a coronavirus that it, that it, that it might be dealing with. But what's your sense, like looking from the outside, what you think the main lessons are that we, we might have learned from this, or is really the main lesson that it, it's impossible to tell from the outside that we're going to need this um, public inquiry that's increasingly being discussed because we just don't know what's what's in daily briefings. We, we obviously are getting quite a lot of minutes coming out from the SAGE so that, that there does seem to be a, a degree of transparency there that, uh, that um, as a historian, we don't, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm not used to seeing sort of government minutes as much in, in, in real time as, as we, perhaps we are with Sage, but at the same time, we don't know exactly all the conversations that are taking place, the sort of the, the risks, the um, um, potential crises that are being confronted. But what, what would be your perspective on looking at this from the outside, having been in a role where you, where you were thinking through a nightmare scenario like this um, when, when you were in government? If you're asking me to uh, pass judgment on the COVID-19 performance, uh, I think I'm going to pass um, for the reason that, uh, as I've said to other people who've asked me this, uh, I think there's a long way more to go in this. And um, uh, although um, people like Laurie Friedman, you know, of your neck of the woods, mm. uh, and Simon Wesley have done quite a lot of good reporting um, on events as they happen. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, I haven't seen anything that they've written about it that um, hasn't rung bells with me. Uh, I think the final judgment um, will have to wait. There's another reason why I think I'd want it to wait. And that is because um, when you're looking at resilience, uh, I found when, when I started doing the job in 2006, uh, there was quite a lot that wasn't known about the nature of resilience, about the best way of managing uh, the risks of disaster. And people were sort of making it up uh, as they went along. But there seemed to me to be three aspects of uh, resilience that you, know, you needed to get right if you were going to have uh, the perfect uh, response to a, a major emergency like that. One is um, the thing that everyone's focused on at the moment, which is the response. Uh, and the response. Uh, by government uh, and by uh, organizations throughout the country that have been involved in this. And, uh, but the response uh, itself, uh, it's going to be better if you have been able to build up what the global risk network of the World Economic Forum calls uh, resilience characteristics of the country, which are, um, you know, the characteristics of being robust and resourceful and, <clears throat> and having sort of spare capacity of people, organizations, government, uh, and the economy. And uh, when we were trying to build a resilient strategy, uh, we sort of started to get into that by making sure that at least um, the providers of essential services had a lot more information that they could use to build their ability to um, you know, carry on going through uh, a major emergency. And then the third, um, Bit of resilience is the need to adapt to changes in the risk environment. And um, if I was planning uh, a commission on COVID-19, I want to see all three of those things done because if we just stop now and say, well, the government was a bit slow starting, it was a bit in two minds as to whether to try and preserve people's livelihoods or preserve people's lives uh, and so forth, then you, you won't have got uh, the full picture. I think the other thing I'd like to say about it is that um, by the time I finished, we sort of, we've done quite a lot of work with other countries. And uh, there's a sort of agreement that the management of critical risks and COVID-19 you know, is certainly a critical risk by any definition. 
depends on um, a lot of things um, which are not to do with PPE and so forth, but it's to do with behavior. And uh, so when uh, we start to judge the behavior of uh, the government on this, uh, I think I'd use these five headings as a, a way of, <coughs> of um, working out what they did right and what they could have done better. Uh, and the first is whether they effectively worked across boundaries. And you know, the boundaries that we're talking about are not just um, international boundaries, which are just being <coughs> tested at the moment with the, the uh, vaccination nationalism debate that's, that's taking place, but also the boundaries between the public and the private sector, the boundaries between the emergency services, the boundaries between um, central government, um, uh, national government, uh, regional government, local government, uh, and the boundaries between science and policy and so forth. So um, uh, resilience is a sort of collaborative um, function. Uh, and if you don't get that wrong, uh, then, and then I think arguably in the United States, they got that really badly wrong. Mm. The arguments between you know, the scientists in government and, <clears throat> and so forth, which are just uh, unhelpful. Um, the second thing is whether they understood the risk. Uh, and then we have the argument about whether they put too much emphasis on planning for a, a flu pandemic. Um, and somehow miss, missed the trick because um, COVID's um, coronaviruses are different. Um, I, th I think that's uh, my view about that is that we can always improve our risk assessment. And I'd be amazed if uh, there wasn't more work done on the, um, the variants that there are of uh, infectious, newly emerging infectious, infectious disease. Um, they did have them on the register. I remember having SARS when I started. Uh, I think they were. Um, taking into account Ebola, Zika, uh, and a whole lot of others. But what they won't have done yet, because uh, you can't have a separate plan for every single um, disease uh, epidemic. Uh, well, you can, but it's uh, a hell of a lot of work. Mm. Uh, the third thing is whether they communicated the risks effectively and um, uh, the key reason for that is that um, the, uh, it's what I said before, if you can't uh, tell people what it is that they have to do and you can't communicate a sense of um, competence in government, then <clears throat> the thing gets out of control. And again, we've seen that in parts of the United States where um, uh, you know, anti-vaccination uh, theories have been uh, rife. Mm. And also in parts of the world where uh, the implication of um, curtailing people's civil rights um, you know, unless they see some convincing case for temporarily surrendering uh, <clears throat> their freedoms, then uh, you may well be lost. Um, and then the, uh, I can't remember, I, I had five, didn't I? Well, one of them is also uh, making sure you know who's responsible for it, but I, mm. or for planning and responding. I think the only thing I'd say there is that resilience, you really have to build from the bottom up. Mm. And uh, there's some indications that uh, they could have made better use of the local resilience forums and other sort of more local mm. agencies than, than they did. Um, but it's always tempting when you're dealing with a major national crisis to, to keep the sort of instruments go control mm. uh, to yourself it's quite difficult to uh, let it go mm. yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 
I, I'd, be, I'd be interested to see you know, other people's experience. I mean, I, I obviously one of the things from teaching online at the moment, we're obviously people are, are not all in Britain at the moment. So I'd be interested to hear people's perspectives from their countries, whether whether there's uh, where any of this sort of relates to them as their, um, uh, whether there's any sort of comparative angle that we that we can learn from. But um, yeah, are there any questions that jump out? I, I, have, a, I have a number that I would, uh, I would still love to ask, but uh, any, has anyone, um, any questions they, they want to want to throw out either in, a, in, in the written chat or um, or by putting your hand up I'll give you a, a second just to to compose yourself for that um, otherwise I'll, I'll move on to another one of mine okay well while people are thinking I'm gonna I'm gonna ask actually just the difficulties of planning for uncertainty and contingency um, and particularly planning for something which, as you mentioned, it, it's so difficult when you're when you're planning for things which you just you've got you've got no idea what's going to come down the pipeline. Um, are there are there intellectual ways of thinking? Are there are there um, educational programs? Are there certain degrees that would help you to be better at identifying things, thinking outside of the box? And you've been talking about sort of a strategic mindset. I mean, are, are there ways that you can be better at planning for uncertainty? Um, I think you can get too um, tied up with the uncertainty argument. I think it's certainly worth, uh, if you're investing major resources in it, I, as governments do, then you have to take account of uncertainty because uh, it's part of the investment appraisal. Mm. But the um, the basis of the strategy that um, I was part of uh, implementing was that we would look at, uh, at one end of the uh, spectrum, the things that are most likely to happen, uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, the things that would have the worst impact if they did happen, mm. even if it was quite unlikely that they would happen. Uh, and uh, we built up our matrices. Um, people who have looked at the National Risk Register, uh, they'll see the, the sort of result you get. You get a picture where there are some things, quite a lot of things that um, are relatively low impact, the high likelihood. Uh, and uh, you know, for those you uh, you need to be uh, pretty well ready because one or other of them is probably going to happen, uh, and they tend to have similar effects. They hurt people, they disrupt essential services, uh, they cause economic damage, uh, they can cause environmental damage, they cause anxiety, and you know you just need a plan to deal with that kind of thing, based partly on risk communication. You tell people these things happen. And when they do, uh, <clears throat> this is the sort of thing that you have to do as an individual, or this is the sort of thing that you have to do as a business. Uh, and this is what, in the meantime, uh, the emergency service is going to be doing. Mm. So there's that bunch. Then you have the uh, what we call the realistic or reasonable worst case scenarios, which are really for the government to deal with, which say, OK, fine, some of them not many of them are going to happen very often. Uh, unfortunately, a flu pandemic was reckoned on uh, a fairly high likelihood, high, very high impact uh, contingency. Um, but uh, if there's a reasonable chance that they're going to happen at all, then you need to look at those. And uh, so that way of looking at things saying okay what's the most likely thing that happened what's the worst that could happen gives you the basis for um preparedness planning using whatever you've got on the shelf mm. uh, for the most likely stuff and contingency planning for the uh the, the more serious but um, hopefully less frequent things when it comes to what you do about them then you know my simple rule of thumb is that there are quite a lot of them where you can't prevent them from happening. But if they've got a very serious impact, then your first uh, port of call 
is uh, to work out how you can prevent things from causing the sort of damage that they do cause. And there's usually only three ways you can do that. You can either uh, work on the risk itself. So if you're, um, if you're talking about a terrorist, uh, then uh, you can prevent people becoming terrorists or you can make it more difficult for them to do what they um, uh, want to do. So inhibit their capability mm. uh, and their motivation. And uh, in addition to that, you can reduce your exposure to them. So if you're talking about a flood risk, then you know, put your, your housing in a place where it's not exposed to flood risk, mm. or coastal flood risk or river flood risk. And if you can't move them and you can't do that, then you look at vulnerability issues. So you know, put your um, flood barriers <clears throat> and so forth. And all of this is part of um, the thing that the government adopted way back yonder, which is a, basically a risk management strategy. Mm. So you start with anticipation, which is looking ahead and looking back and saying what's going to happen. Then do the assessment, which is how serious would it be if it did happen? What are the impacts going to be on the things that we care about? So human life, essential services, mm. so forth, so forth. Uh, and then, then you get to the, um, the prevent side, which are the ones that we want to try and prevent, either by working on the risk itself, if we can, and if not, by working on exposure and vulnerability. And then you get round to the prepare thing. Okay, assuming you've done everything you can to prevent the ones that you want to prevent, then uh, how can we uh, get better prepared on the assumption that uh, sooner or later one or one or the other will get through. And how about, so you, you're dealing with this in quite a sophisticated, nuanced way, sort of. And, and I, I've seen you you've written in really interesting ways about scientists advising um, um, policymakers. How do you deal with policymakers who have these very sort of short term, very short term considerations? They might be thinking there's a by election coming up in a few months, or I've got to go on Andrew Marr on Sunday and I've got to announce something or Piers Morgan is on Twitter and he's raging against us, we need a response. How do you deal with that when, you're, when, you, when your job is mainly to take a step back and think broadly and think in a sort of um, a more sort of cooler mindset when yeah, there's all these sort of things which are sort of heating up the political process? Well, you do it deliberately and systematically is mm. how you do it. Uh, and ever since um, we, uh, Tony Blair, decided he wants something done about the risks of um, these emergencies, all governments uh, since that time have received more or less uh, every year, first of all, and then every two years, um, a comprehensive risk assessment which says this is the worst that could happen in about 80, 85 different types of um, emergency uh, and uh, we reckon the, the impacts are uh, like this and we reckon that the likelihood is like that and it fills a matrix which should be read or looked at the National Risk Register you can see sort of thing it is except that the, the government national risk assessment which they now call the National uh, Strategic Risk Assessment um, is a lot more busy than the uh, National Risk Register is and um, they can see uh, what uh, the assessment by scientists and civil servants and other experts is of the different risks. Um, we usually put up some recommendations and say look um, we've actually done quite a lot of work on these so far. Uh, the next step would probably to do a little bit more work on on these, which have, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more difficult and may need a little bit more um, research into them. And it's just a systematic way of going through the full range of, you know, 80 to 85 risks and saying, OK, uh, this is how they look at the moment. Uh, these are the ones where we're not so certain. And before we put a lot of money into them, we'd like to do a little bit more research. These are the ones where we're pretty certain and we also think that our capacity uh, is not up to scratch uh, and the lead government department then um, 
would be invited to go and do some more uh, investment on it. In all these things, and one of the things that issues that's going to come out with the COVID, uh, there's the distinction between capability and capacity. Since 2001, the capability of British governments to deal with it, capability is, you know, the, the ways of dealing with these risks. Um, the science that you've got to deal with, uh, medical science you've got to deal with, pandemics and so forth, is very high. What is often not so high is the capacity, because if you have, you're able to, uh, <clears throat> uh, you understand what the risk is and you have the, the technology or the science uh, to deal with it, or the case, then it's no good if you haven't got enough of that. And very often the issue is capacity. So um, with COVID-19, the capacity of the health service, uh, which has for many, many years been run on making it as efficient as possible, uh, has probably suffered by comparison with, say, Germany, where um, you know, they spend something like 12% of GDP on health services and so forth. So, you know, you start with the risk assessment, the, the grid, the matrix, uh, with the, the ones in the top right hand corner where you have to have a plan to do everything, to try and prevent it, to prepare for it. Uh, and you put everything into it because it's the most likely and the most serious. And then the bottom right hand stuff, uh, you might delegate down to a local level and say, actually, these are local emergencies. What you need to do is to build up your capacity to do this and then you have the stuff on the left the uh, the sort of black swans the low likelihood but very high impact ones where uh you know on the whole where i would be looking for is to try and improve what you've got mm. rather than invest a whole lot of stuff against an event that might not happen more than you know one in a thousand years so just one, one final question that I wanted to just to, to leave us with is, um, and as I say, this this might um, feel free to to bat this away if if you'd like. Is there one issue that you think at the moment that perhaps we're not paying enough attention to that sort of down the line from your work, sort of thinking in a few years down the line, we could could, could come over the horizon and be a real um, challenge that we're that we're going to be facing, but which we haven't really in the political bandwidth at the moment or journalistic bandwidth. We're not spending enough time thinking about. Well, I'm going to put a disclaimer on this because the um, the risks that um, we included in the national risk assessment and later in the national security risk assessment uh, are risks of uh, disaster or emergency. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the whole, there's a fairly clear definition of what we mean by an emergency, which is an event that causes harm to human welfare or national or security uh, somewhere in, in the UK. Uh, so in order to qualify, it's got to physically hurt someone or something. Uh, well, well, thank you very much, um, for, and, and for, for giving us your insights on these topics, um, such, such urgent ones, but also such uh, such important long-term questions that, that we'll be thinking about. And uh, yes, I think for anyone looking at a career in the civil service, in the political risk world, in, in, in these questions of, of planning and resilience, um, there's some real um, food for thought. And um, yes, so thank you so much, uh, John, for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to uh, so hope you're having a chance to chat again soon. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.